All right, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. This is Election Sunday, 2016. If you go back and study the churches of colonial America, you will know that every Lord's Day previous to an election, whether it be national or local, the churches would have what they called election Sunday sermons or election sermons, they would devote the entire Lord's Day focused on the various issues relating to the elections that were at hand, giving the people in the congregations the biblical principles that they would need to make wise choices, not based upon personality or hype or uh, other very uh, frivolous and superficial reasons, but based upon biblical truth. The pastors of colonial America were constantly teaching the people of their churches the principles of natural law. They were constantly teaching them the principles of liberty that we find in biblical law. It was not just a once a year message, though that election uh, Sunday sermon may have uh, been more of a focus than perhaps other Sundays. But throughout the course of a normal year, the pastors of Colonial America were faithful to preach and teach these principles to their people on a regular basis. If the pastors of Colonial America had not done this, there is no way that America would have fought a revolutionary war for independence in 1775 and forward. There is no way that we would have broken with Great Britain. We would not have had a Lexington Green event, the shot heard around the world. We would not have had a Bunker Hill. There would not have been a declaration of independence. There would not, would not have been a a revolutionary war, there would not have been a constitutional convention, this country would not exist. It's because of the steadfast and steady preaching of colonial pastors in that period of time that gave the people the spiritual understanding, the natural understanding, the scriptural understanding to know how to stand and fight for liberty when the day came that it was necessary to do so. If you think for one minute that those men made a decision at 4 o'clock in the morning on April 19, 1775 to stand in front of 800 British troops, about 77 or 78 of them, muskets in hand, standing right outside the door of the church that they attended every Sunday, most of these men were members of the church at Lexington on which the green they stood. If you think they made that decision at 4 o'clock in the morning when they went out there to face the British, you don't understand anything. The decision was already made years before. Those men understood the issues of liberty. They understood when it was time to fight and when it was time not to fight. They understood the principles of redress. They understood the principles of, of government. They understood the biblical laws of government. They understood the natural laws, the territorial nature of government, the jurisdictional nature of government. They understood all of these issues very clearly and plainly. They were inculcated deeply into their hearts because they had been taught that by Pastor Jonas Clark and the other pastors of New England on a regular basis in their churches every Sunday. Stop and think about it. There is no other 
occupation, if you want to look at it that way, in the entire world that has a captive audience to the magnitude anything close to what the pastors of America have every Sunday in their churches. 300,000 evangelical churches in the United States of all sizes, of all brands, of all denominations. Over 300,000. Every Sunday there is an audience that numbers into the tens and tens and tens of millions that are sitting in front of a pastor each week in more or less a captive fashion listening to him deliver the principles of God's word, at least that's what he should be delivering. Think what could happen in America almost overnight. Forget the two major political parties. Forget liberal conservative. Forget the two extreme uh, party and, and position uh, paradigms that we're so caught up in. Forget the media. Forget all of these other factors that now have dominated our political and, and, so, and social and cultural and, and intellectual uh, mediums in this country. Put all that aside. Think what could happen in this country if those 300,000 pastors, or at least a sizable percentage of them, were standing up in their pulpits every Sunday and they were preaching the kind of messages that they preached in 1775 and 1776 in colonial America. I submit to you that with no help from either political party, with no help from the media, with no help from the pollsters, with no help from the educational elite and the lobbyists and all of the rest, with no help from anyone else, the pastors of America have it in their power to change the course of the nation any time they wanted to do it. They're not doing it. They're playing games for the most part. It's all about feel-good-ism. It's all about entertainment. It's all about buildings. It's about budgets. It's about crowds. It's about notoriety. It's about success. It's, 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 it's a business that they give to them uh, to themselves in a very similar way that any other uh, major business would operate. And as a result, our people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's really not that the people of America have rejected truth. Some have, obviously. But that's not the biggest percentage. The biggest percentage is not that they've rejected truth. The biggest percentage is they haven't heard truth. They haven't heard it. And that's why so many people have awakened to our message here at Liberty Fellowship. That's why so many people around the country watch us every Sunday afternoon. It's why people have, have picked up their belongings oftentimes and moved themselves halfway across the country to be part of this fellowship. It's why that there are other fellowships such as this that are springing up all over the country. Pastors that are preaching the, the liberty message of natural law and biblical law. It's resonating with people. People are recognizing that we are in a dire strait as a nation. They know that things cannot keep going the way they are, even though pastors would like you to believe that they, things can just keep going the way they are. And they can still invest millions of dollars in their gymnasiums and their playground equipment and all their recreational stuff. And they play games every Sunday. Teenagers, adults, and kids all playing games. All just everything is fine. Everything is wonderful. And the country is burning down around them and they seem to be oblivious to it.
One day the fire is going to burn down that multiple million dollar gymnasium. One day it's going to burn down that recreation center and all these entertainment oriented programs that dominate the vast majority of our churches today. Because when the curtain falls, the scripture says, I think basically the best summation, when it rains, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. And when the rain of God's judgment falls on this country, these compromising, cowardly churches are not going to be exempt from the consequences. There is a passage that Jesus mentions in the midst of his address in chapter 5 that I think is very fitting for our day today. He gives the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, etc., etc. Go down to verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Well, reading that, I'm a blessed man. <laughs> Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now look at what he said in verse 13, and this is our text. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, not save your, he's not talking about losing the grace of God. He's not talking about losing the eternal salvation that God gave you through faith in Christ. The savor is the ingredient of the salt that makes it salty. It is the chemical ingredient that gives salt the nature that it possesses. You and I would not live very long without salt in our bodies. Our bodies are dependent on salt as much as it is water. Salt is the preservative of decay and putrefaction for many, many centuries. That was the only way that men had of keeping meat from spoiling was to soak it in salt. But if the salt has lost its innate chemical content, it's no longer salty. It's no longer able to preserve the meat. It's lost the ingredient that the decaying meat needs to keep itself from spoiling. If he's lost the savor, wherewith shall it be salted? What are you going to use to take the place of salt? Of course, speaking of the days uh, that Jesus spoke, uh, salt would have been the only means by which this could have taken place. What are you going? If the salt is not salty, if the salt is not able to preserve the decay in the meat, what are you going to use? What is the substitute for salt? It is there thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the salt of the earth. You, the disciples, the followers of Christ, the church, you are the salt of the earth. You are the reason that society doesn't decay and completely spoil. 
It is because of you that society is preserved. It is because of you that society does not totally decay and become putrid. You are the salt. But if you, the salt, loses the savor, you lose your saltiness, you lose the innate ingredient that you need to preserve the rot and the ruin that's going on in society around you, then where is the salt going to come from? And I tell you the truth, the salt to preserve this country is not going to come from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or any other political party in this country. The salt is not going to come from the media. <laughs> Boy, that's an understatement. <laughs> the salt is not going to come from the, the halls of Congress or from the halls of, of academia. The salt, it can only come, the only place that has the nature, the innate nature of salt is within the church the body of Christ. We are not here in the condition that we are in as a nation politically because of the politicians. We are here as a nation politically, culturally, socially, morally, in every other way because of the pastors of America. That's why we are here. If the pastors of America had been like colonial pastors, I promise you the two candidates that we would be choosing from in 2016 would not be Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. The choices we are given are the choices that the pastors, through their lack of saltiness in the pulpits, have given us. Until the Christians of America wake up to the fact that only the pulpits of America can save us, until they wake up to the fact that only the churches are the answer, only the Christian salt can do the salty work of preserving society, as long as they keep looking at Fox News and the GOP that they think is God's own party and any other political solution to our ills, are only going to continue to contribute to the further decay of our society. When the church, the pastors, lose the salt, what's, what's the church good for? It's good for nothing. Not my words his words. They are good for nothing. And I'm not trying to be, God knows my heart, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I am being realistic. There are many pulpits across this country with hundreds of thousands and millions of Christians out there in the audience each Sunday. That as far as the salt being necessary, the saltiness of the message that we need to preserve the liberties and the independence of our blessed nation are good for nothing. I'm, I'm, I, I don't enjoy saying that but they're good for nothing. Pastor, what good does it do to have a big crowd 
and a lot of money in the offering plate and big buildings and your name written up in the ministerial journals and a 401k that's very desirable and a salary that's very comfortable and all of the perks that go along with the position of pastoring a notable, prestigious church in the community. What good is that when the salt of your message is gone and you're not preserving the pure meat of the nation and allowing our country to spoil and to decay because of a lack of salt from your church. What good is it all? It's henceforth good for nothing. But Jesus didn't stop there. He said, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. If you believe in writing notes in your Bible, which I think is a good idea, you might just want to write the word tyranny right after that verse. I think that's a pretty good definition of tyranny. Trodden under foot of men. In Nazi Germany, they called it jackboots. Trodden under foot of men. Tyranny. Churches, pastors, are supposed to be the vanguards of liberty and truth, protecting the people, the community, and the nation from tyranny. If the pastors don't do it, it won't get done. If the churches don't do it, it won't get done. We are on the verge of outright tyranny. Washington, D.C. has been flirting with tyranny for decades. A little bit here, a little bit there, encroachment here, encroachment there, injustice here, injustice there, trample the Bill of Rights here, trample the Bill of Rights there, ignore the Constitution here, ignore the Constitution there. Bit by bit, piece by piece, over the last several decades, our federal government has been toying with tyranny. There are millions of immigrants in this country who fled some of the world's worst tyrannical governments to come here to live in a land of freedom. I've met many of them, you've met many of them, you may know some of them personally as I do. People that fled Stalin's purges in Russia. People that fled Germany's Nazism under Hitler. People that fled Mao Zedong's communism in China or some of the tyrants of Africa. They came to this country yearning to breathe free. And you talk to these people and they will tell you to a person, I've not talked to a single one, and I've talked to several. And each one of them has told me, what I see happening in the United States today is what my parents and grandparents saw happening in the oppressed nations of Europe and Asia years ago. We're following the same pattern. And they are very fearful that the United States is about to go into tyranny and they have a right to be afraid. Pastors have stopped preaching the principles of natural law and the principles of biblical leadership. 
I have given several messages over an extended period of time on the subject of biblical leadership. I've talked quite a bit about what are the biblical requirements that God has given for civil leadership, civil magistrates. You talk to the average Christian in the average church about what do we need in government and they'll they'll give you this answer. What we need in government is we just need to elect more Christians. Really? We've been electing Christians, so-called, forever. Every politician is a Christian, at least on election years. Have you ever heard anybody come and say, Vote for me, everybody. I hate God. I'm an atheist. I'm not a Christian. No, she doesn't profess that. There's not a verse in the Bible anywhere that instructs us as God's people to elect Christians. I challenge you to find that verse. It's not there. But what is there is a lot of information relative to what are the natural and the biblical laws relative to civil magistrates and the responsibility that we have to hold those civil magistrates accountable to those principles. For us as Americans, our job as citizens and voters when it comes to those that we elect, it really is pretty simple. I mean, outside of the biblical principles that God has given us to the nature and the character of the civil magistrate, which most people don't even look at anymore, including Christians. They don't even look at the principles that God has given us in his And by the way, if you've not had this, the biblical standard for government is a message I preached before I came to Montana. So unless you have this DVD, you've not heard this message particularly. But in this message, I go into great detail as to what are the, re the requirements for civil magistrates. So I encourage you to get that. But the truth of the matter is, if the pastors of America and the Christians of America would do one thing when it comes to our civil magistrate, our elected office holders, whether it's city, county, state, or federal levels. If we would do one thing, we would live in a different country, a better country. What's that one thing? Hold our civil magistrates to their oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. That. That is what they took an oath to do. Every office holder stands on the day that they are placed in office. They hold their hand in the air, the other hand on a Bible, and they swear before God and the people that voted for them that they will preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and of their state. And for the most part, they do not honor their word. And for the most part, we, the voters, do not hold their feet to the fire to be sure they do what they said they would do. And if we would if we would vote out every election, if we would vote out Republican, Democrat, white, black, male, female, doesn't matter. If we would vote out every civil magistrate who hasn't 
followed the Constitution over the previous term. It wouldn't take too many elections, and it might dawn on some of these people that are running for office, you know what, if I want to stay here, I better obey the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> but the people don't do it. We just keep re-electing these people that defy their oath and deny the Constitution. Pastors have stopped preaching the principles of natural law. They don't understand it themselves. They've not been taught it. The seminaries, the colleges, the universities in the Christian realm do not teach the principles of natural law. It hadn't been taught in these institutions in over a century. They themselves are ignorant of natural law. And yet, it, natural law is throughout the whole Bible. And I've, I quite often allude to this when I'm going through scripture by scripture. I've got messages over there or online if you're watching, uh, talking about, I have a whole, I got a disc of four messages that deal with nothing but natural law. I have a, a message on the, on the natural law of revolution and other relevant uh, message. I have a message that I quoted from Jonas Clark in 1776 on April 19, the day that he, he gave his famous sermon in which he discussed the, uh, the shot fired heard around the world a year before on front of his church do door. And he preached and told the whole story and then gave the biblical principles behind it. And I, I recreated that and I, I preached it word for word. That's available. I mean, these are the things that the pastors of America are not preaching. And so people are getting their information and they're getting their education from Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity and Megyn Kelly. And you really wonder why we're in the mess we're in. <laughs> the pastors used to be the ones with this book as the source, teaching the principles the people needed to be good citizens and to elect good leaders about the only thing you're going to hear all over America today in churches on this election Sunday, you know what you're going to, you're going to hear? If they say anything at all, the pastors are going to stand up and they're going to say, pray about who you vote for. Boy, what a brave piece of instruction that was. <laughs> Pray for God's will to be done in the election. They've gone all year and they haven't said a word about what are the principles that should guide us as we go into an election process. What are the principles of God's word? Where are the principles of natural law? What are the principles of good government that we need to be aware of and that we need to make a part of our process and our thinking and our selection and so forth. None, none of that all year long. Nothing, 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 nothing. And then the Sunday before, pray about who you're going to vote for. And you know what a lot of Christians do when they go into the, well, the ones that vote, you know the, what, they, what they do when they go into the ballot? They do a they do a quick prayer. They have their names. They have no idea. Outside of the race for president, most of the races people aren't even aware of. You can ask, you can ask a lot of people, who's the current governor of your state? And they won't even know who the governor is. You can ask people, who's the vice president of the United States? You never used to watch Jay, Jay Leno on his jaywalking? Who is the first president of the United States? We're talking educated people. We're talking college kids and college graduates and, you know. Who are your, who are your, who's your congressman in your district? 
They panic. They don't. But you ask them some Hollywood celebrity, what's their birthday, and they'll know that. No, of course you don't. You go to Liberty Fellowship. <laughs> Give yourselves a hand. Come on. I'm not talking to you specifically. That's the ignorant. And so they go into the, to the voting booth and they have, they have name, all these names. And so then they throw up a quick prayer. Lord, who do I vote for? And it's like opening your Bible. Oh, right, Lord. What, what scripture I need to read? Ignorant, ignorant, ignorant Christians. I'll just say this about the particular presidential race that's in front of us. Uh, I'm not going to make it anywhere near the, the bulk of this message, but I'll just give you this. If Hillary Clinton wins, we, are in, we as freedom-loving, constitution-loving, Bill of Rights-loving, God-loving people, pro-life loving, we are going to be in for the biggest fight of our lives. Especially on the Second Amendment issue. There is no question if she's elected the second amendment will be in her crosshairs and we are going to have to prove to her and to the people in DC that will be working for her that law or no law, Hillary Clinton or no Hillary Clinton, we will never, as freedom-loving Americans, never surrender our firearms. Never. We will have to prove that, not just with applause on a Sunday afternoon church service, but in our heart of hearts and in our action, when we say to anyone that would seek to take them from us, Milan LeBay. There is no question we will be in the fight for our lives. Hillary Clinton is the quintessential corrupt politician. Her and her husband Bill have, from the time he was governor of Arkansas, have excelled at the art of corruption. They sold the White House to foreign influence when he was president. She sold the Secretary of State's office to foreign influence when she was Secretary of State. The investigations that, that are ongoing, and I just heard right before the service, about five minutes before the service started, one of our men came and told me that he just saw it on his, on his phone, the, the, the report just came over that, as you know, FBI Director Comey said that he was reopening the email investigation on Hillary a few days, what, a week or so ago, and everybody in the, now came out and said, he's closing the case. No. 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 
which proves FBI Director James Comey is a part of the Clinton oligarchy cabal that is corrupt and is willing to secure corruption in our government. I want to know what the FBI rank and file officers are going to do. How long are you, ladies and gentlemen, going to sit and be subservient and take orders from a director who is obviously a corrupt director and who was willing to cover up corruption at the highest level in our country and you are willing to join him in saying to the American people that there are two standards of law in this country, one for all of us and then another set of laws from the Clintons and those who say they are above the law. Every FBI agent, it's time to do some soul searching yourself about what is right and what is wrong in this country. So I, I, I just tell you that, that we will be in for the fight of our lives. If Donald Trump wins, he is a much lesser known, he's untested in the political world. He has said some really, really great things. And if he were to put in practice some of the things that he has said, it would be a great improvement in our country. But he's also said things that are very, very horrible. And if he puts those in practice, it would not be good. The truth of the matter is, if Donald Trump is elected, we don't know which one is going to show up. It's a big question mark. If Donald Trump is elected, what we will have to do as freedom-loving, constitutional-minded Americans is we will need to do with him what we should be doing with every single person who gains public office. We need to be holding their feet to the fire and making sure that they don't violate the principles of natural law and the principles of constitutional government. In other words, what happens so many times, you have a liberal Democrat that everybody's scared to death of, and then they get defeated at the election, and, and then the Republican goes in, and the Christians and many of the other conservatives, they, they let out a big sigh of relief, and then they go into a coma for the next four years. <laughs> and oftentimes, the Republican administrations, as was the case in the eight years of G.W. Bush and the four years of G.H.W. Bush, did more damage to our country and to the Constitution than the Democrats did before them. With Clinton, we know what we're going to be dealing with. With Trump, we're not sure. And my only counsel to those of you that are uh, concerned about this election regarding these two individuals, I would just say if Mr. Trump wins, and, and it, it, truly if, if Hillary wins, it, it's, it's going to be an unbelievable, that's going to be an unbelievable situation. But if Trump wins, if you go to sleep, if you just think all is well with the world and everything is going to be right just because you got your guy in office, if you're not willing to hold him accountable to the same standards that we would hold the Democrat accountable to, then you're part of the problem. I had my radio talk show. I started it when Bill Clinton was president. I laid it out five days a week, two hours a day on my national radio talk show, talking about the unconstitutionality of, of Clinton's actions and everybody thought I was a hero. 
I was the up and coming superstar of Republican conservatism. Anybody who was anybody in the Republican Party when they came to my district called me up and wanted to be interviewed on my show, wanted to meet with me. I, I, they couldn't say anything bad about me. And then G.W. Bush got elected in 2000. <laughs> Last time I checked, the Constitution didn't change when G.W. Bush got elected. <laughs> same Constitution, same law, same standards. And when G.W. Bush started violating the Constitution, I was saying the same thing that I was saying for the previous six years or eight years when Bill Clinton was doing the damage. Only thing now, it was a Republican. And now all of a sudden, Chuck Baldwin went from hero to villain. And that's the problem. When it comes to good government, when it comes to the principles of truth in, the, in natural law and in God's law and in constitutional law, it shouldn't matter to a hill of beans whether the legislator, the senator, the president is a Republican or a Democrat. We must stick to the principles of truth or we are going to allow this two-party phony paradigm destroy our country. And that's what's happened over the last several decades. Pastors are dealing with many issues. Pastors fear this is all going back to the good for nothing topic. Pastors fear they might jeopardize their 501c3 nonprofit tax status. Most churches, unfortunately, are up to their eyeballs in debt. They bought into this debt spending mentality that the rest of the country has bought into. Our nation is $20 trillion in debt. I throw that out like, you know, oh, what's $20 trillion? I mean, you know, like who was it that said, you know, a trillion here and a trillion there, and pretty soon you're talking about serious money. <laughs> $20 trillion. But that doesn't include the personal debt of the American citizenry. If you add that indebtedness to the equation, now we're talking about an excess of 60 trillion in debt. We have gone from the greatest producing nation to the greatest debtor nation in history. It's not just the federal government that's in debt. Everybody's in debt. People spending what they don't have. People spending what they can't afford. Churches have done the same thing. In the average church, if there was a 5% hiccup in income, they would not meet their expenses. They wouldn't make their building payments, their salaries, their insurance. They would not meet their expense. 5% hiccup would put them under. They borrowed to the hilt. And unfortunately, so many people look to their contributions as a tax incentive instead of an act of worship to God 
we were instructed in God's holy word to give to the Lord our tithes and our offerings a long time before Senator Lyndon Johnson ever put the Johnson Amendment in the IRS code in 1954. Christians have been giving to God out of an act of love, out of an act of worship, out of an act of obedience to the Lord, out of an act of wanting the blessing of heaven upon their lives and their work, living by faith and believing that God would bless them for their obedience and their faith. And as they put God first in their giving, God would bless them in their work and in their family and in their lives. And out of that act of adoration and love and obedience, they gave to God their tithes and offerings and never gave a second thought about what it meant at the end of the year on a tax form. But the Johnson Amendment and the whole 501c3 monstrosity has totally changed the thinking of not only the pastors in the church, but also the people in the congregation. They look at their contributions as a tax deduction, not as an act of worship and obedience to God. And I'll say this to you Christians, if you are giving to your church, which you're really not giving to the church anyway, and I hope people, many people don't understand, you're, when you give your tithes and offerings, you're not giving to Liberty Fellowship or to your church out there or whatever it may happen. When you give your tithes and offerings in the right frame of mind, in the right heart, you're giving it to God. You're giving it to God. And if you are only giving that offering or primarily giving that offering for the purpose of getting a tax deduction at the end of the year from Uncle Sam, with all due sincerity, you have to understand your offerings mean nothing to God. You might as well put your money in a bar or a nightclub. God is not impressed. If the motivation is a tax return at the end of the year from a government that for the most part uses our tax dollars to do things that are unconscionable in the minds and the hearts of Christian people and then you're going to ask a favor of them and that's what you are gearing your giving toward and it's not about God and it's not about his work and it's not about loving him and worshiping him and living by faith you might as well not even give Because it's not an offering. It's just a compliant activity with your tax accountant. They're scared to death they might jeopardize their 501c3. Every year they get, depending on, I don't know what, but maybe two, three, four times a year they will get a brochure in the mail. I know this because I used to get it. I used to pastor a 501c3 church for many, many years, so I know the system very well. Two or three times a year, maybe four, you get a little, really a nice color brochure with glossy paper, slick, you know, really professionally done. And it doesn't come from the IRS normally. It normally comes from a, a, a law firm, a law firm that, working for the IRS and the law firm will send this out and you'll to the, it's, it'll be addressed to the pastor and it'll 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 say as a 501c3 pastor here are the things you can do here are the things you cannot do here are the things you can say and here are the things you cannot say and there'll be bullet points under each category And I always just took those things, and I wish I saved them now. I mean, now doing what I wish, I wish like any, why did I throw those things away? Those would have been great material on Sunday at Liberty Fellowship. But I wasn't thinking about that in those days. I just threw them away.
Most pastors don't throw them away. Most pastors keep them. And they look over them. They study them. And so when they go in the pulpit on Sunday, they want to be sure that they don't say anything that may cross the line on something they read in that brochure. And they live and they preach and they conduct their entire ministry in that fashion. That's one of the reasons that Liberty Fellowship is not and will never be a 501c3 nonprofit organization is because we are not even going to pretend that we are in any shape, manner, or form recognizing the federal government or the Internal Revenue Service control over what we say, what we preach, what we do, and so we just don't even claim tax deduction. And if that keeps some of you from giving to Liberty Fellowship, so be it. I would rather not have your giving because you're afraid you won't get a tax deduction and have the freedom to preach and teach what I feel it needs to be done every Sunday in this pulpit than to have your contribution and to feel like that I'm strangled with what I can say and what I cannot say. Thank you. It's not worth it to me. They fear they might offend and therefore lose tithing church members. Christians can be some of the most easily offended people on earth. They walk around with their feelings up on their shoulder. Any little thing can offend them anger them they can they can stomp out the back door I'm never going back to that church pastors know this and remember they're in debt and so they very careful on Sunday what they say they don't want to offend the Joneses because the Joneses give X number of dollars each month into the collection. And we need that. Like I said, 5% and they're in trouble. So they're afraid of losing their tithes and offerings. They're afraid of losing their membership. They're afraid of losing the programs that they may have. Everything is built around having a crowd of people to support this program, this program, this building fund, this project. They couch it in very spiritual sounding terms, but it's all a business. So they're afraid of their own congregations. In fact, pastors are probably more afraid of their own congregations than they are the IRS, if you want to know the truth of the matter. They don't see the IRS eyeball to eyeball every week, but they see their congregations eyeball to eyeball every week. And after the sermon, if he said something a little bit controversial, believe me, there'll be a committee formed to petition the pastor. We don't like the direction of your sermons. Warning shot across the bow. We won't tolerate much more of that. Well, I do love you. But you can get all the committees together you want. You ain't going to determine what I preach on any Sunday in this fellowship.
that message comes from God to the best of my ability to know it. They fear being ostracized by their denomination or their fellow pastors. Most of them are part of ministerial consortiums of one sort or another. They are part of a denominational hierarchy, many of them. They have denominational secretaries, denominational um, headquarters. Depending on the denomination, these denominations can be very dictatorial about what the pastor can preach and what he can't preach. He, in fact, many of these denominations and Sunday school committees and boards and stuff like that, they will actually send pre-packaged lessons and sermons to the pastor to preach for a given quarter or a given season. And they'll actually be preaching what comes down from on high meaning the denominational hierarchy. And that goes on a lot. And then there's the idea of, you know, I don't want to be a castaway from my peer group. You know, they're, they're involved in all kinds of ministerial fellowships, associations. They have friends and mentors in these associations. And if they preach something that's controversial or something that's... Uh, perhaps opposed to established uh, doctrine, then they are going to be ostracized. They won't be given certain positions within the denomination. They, they could lose uh, the ability to borrow money. A lot of these churches borrow money directly from the denominations, not from the banks, which is a benefit financially to them. They get maybe a lower interest rate and they get lower, they, you know, they get better offerings as far as the, the, the uh, mechanics of the loans are concerned. Not every denomination does that, but some do. So they could threaten to cut off a funding source. Um, when people move from one place to the other, they look at the directory of the various denominational churches and where they're going and they will select a church to go to based upon that denomination, etc. So all these things are going on in these pastors' minds when he preaches on any given Sunday. Many of them are following the, the Rick Warrens and the Joel Alsteins of our country, and they're trying to mimic their success-oriented churches. That means to be successful in their, in their pattern of ministry, they must be very social. It's a social environment. It's a social activity. Everybody wants to socialize. Dinner outs and potlucks and suppers and lunches are huge in many, if not most, churches. People want to socialize. The average church in America today is a glorified social club. That's all it is. It's all about social activity. It's all about people getting together and socializing, having a good time, and they gear all of their ministries around that social part of the, of the work. And that's why... You'll, you, you pick up the average bulletin and the average church on a given Sunday, the, the, you know, the little menus that they give you when you go in, tells you what's going to happen next and what's going to happen next and what's going to happen next. And there's, you know, they're so organized, the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with it. But it, it they got it all planned out. And you'll see all kinds of potluck dinners and fellowship dinners and suppers and lunches this and lunches that. I mean... All the time, all the time, socializing, socializing, socializing. Recreation is very important to the successful church. Yeah, that's why you got to have a gymnasium. That's why you got to have you you got to have a you got to have a playground that competes with McDonald's. If your playground doesn't compete with McDonald's, then you've got to step up to the plate. You're losing 
ground. And so people will put all kinds of money into kids' playground stuff. Millions and millions and millions of dollars in gymnasiums and, and playground equipment and pl playing, 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 playing. Soft church softball leagues, bowling leagues, basketball leagues, you name it, church sponsored sports out the gazebo. That word just came to me, it didn't. <laughs> and it's got to be pleasurable. It's got to be pleasurable. It's got to be fun. You got to feel good. Well, you know, if your heart's really right, with God, you should feel good about the truth. Amen. What do you want? You want somebody to stand up here and stroke you and tell you how pretty you are and how wonderful you are and how great you are. And how, oh, be, oh, wow, that pastor made me feel so good. Walk out like a peacock. Your tail feathers just flowing in the breeze. <laughs> or do you want to walk out with a deep conviction in your heart and in your soul saying, yes, I heard the truth. I love the truth. This was a great day. got to be social, got to be recreational, got to be pleasurable, and by all means, it can't be controversial. It can't be controversial. Because somebody won't agree. Somebody get upset. And so they have all that on their plate. These are the things that every pastor is going through in one degree or another every, every Sunday when he stands up to preach. You, you wonder why you're not hearing the salty messages that are needed to preserve a sick and decadent society. All these things are a part of the answer. And while, while we're on the subject, I can't go any further without saying to the congregations, The congregations, for the most part, have let their pastors know that they like the way things are. They don't want the pastor to be truthful. Oh, he can be truthful to a point. It's okay. But not when he steps on my toes and not when he gets in areas that involve politics. <laughs> Separation of church and state. Well, it's a good thing our founding fathers didn't know anything about that perverse teaching the way it's taught now. The separation of church and state to our founders never meant that the churches were not supposed to deal with issues that are political in nature. The separation of church and state initially originally meant that it was none of the government's business what the church did or said. That's what it meant. And I want to remind our pastors that we, gentlemen, when we stand in front of our congregations, in truth, we are not standing before them. We are standing before God. Let me give you some verses. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, 
as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. Now he was standing in front of the king, but he said, I'm not standing in front of you, I'm standing in front of the Lord God of heaven. In 1 Kings 18, 15, And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. He said it again. As he stood in front of the people, whether it were kings or people, he said, I stand before God. And he delivered the message. 2 Kings 3, 14, And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. 2 Kings 5, 16. But he, Elisha, said, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand. He said it twice. 2 Chronicles 29, verses 4 and 11. I, I love this passage. And King Hezekiah. brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the East Street. And he said, My sons, be not now negligent. For the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, that ye should minister unto him can you imagine a king wouldn't it be great I would love to hear any president I would love to hear Donald Trump if he gets elected president I would I would love to hear him or any president stand up and in one of the first things that he would do in an address to the nation is say you pastors of America God has called you to stand before him and speak the truth. You men, preach for God and stand for God. I'd love to hear any governor say that. I'd love to hear any mayor say that. King Hezekiah got all the priests and the Levites together and said, God has chosen you to stand before him and serve him. Now, get on with your job. Wow. Now, that would be a message that could help change the course of the country. Pastor's going, whoa. The president wants me to be a man of God. In my favorite verse, Ezekiel 22:30, God said to his prophet, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land. Stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. That I should not destroy it. But I found none. I think God is still looking for some men that will stand in the gap before God so God won't destroy our land. Come on, preacher. Stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. I'm just looking at my watch. That doesn't mean anything at all. I'm just, <laughs> just looking at it. There's one more part, and I, this is, I'm talking about the salt has lost its savor. And it's good for nothing but to be trodden underfoot of men. I'm talking about what has caused the salt to lose his savor. And there's one more part. That to be honest with you, I had not even realized 
until God showed me this just recently. <laughs> and I can't believe I didn't see it. The modern church maybe has lost its salt also because it may be under the curse of Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. But not in the way you think. Genesis 12, 3. God said to Abram, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And all over America, preachers are following the likes of John Hagee and others and have misinterpreted that passage to mean that God will bless America if we bless this modern Zionist state of Israel. And that is commonly taught in churches all over America. You will hear it on radio broadcasts. You will hear it on television broadcasts. You will hear it from the pulpits of the vast majority of the churches of America. If we bless this modern Zionist state of Israel, created in 1948, God will bless us. And they use Genesis 12:3 as the proof text. Let's read it again and let's see if we can get a better understanding. I will bless them that bless thee. Bless who? Abram. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, and I have this, if you'll get my message series on the table, if you go to the store online, the church in Israel, I have seven messages that deal with this topic, so I won't go into it as because as, I've gone into it in great detail in those messages, but just for the sake of this message. I will bless them that bless thee. Who does that mean? Well, obviously, Pastor Chuck, it means Israel in 2016. Really? Have you read Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16? And to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. We, in order to be faithful to this command in Genesis 12 and the truth stated in Galatians 3.16, the way we honor that principle is to bless his seed, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are part of the family of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. Everyone, Jew or Gentile, who places their faith in Christ is one in Christ. There's neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, bond or free. We are all one in Christ. Christ and Jesus is the one who bought our salvation on the cross and through whom we exercise our faith in God. The blessing is upon faith in Jesus Christ. Has nothing to do with that 
nation that was created in 1948 on May 14, it has everything to do with our faith in Christ and Christ, the seed of Abraham, who brought us salvation. We bless Jesus Christ. We bless the faith in Jesus Christ. We promote him. We promote faith in him. We honor him. Honor faith in him. Extol him. Extol faith in him. It's all about blessing Jesus. The second part of Genesis 12, 3 says, And curse him that curseth thee. Galatians 3, 9, and 10 gives the New Testament commentary on this. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many, listen carefully, this is again Galatians 3, 9, and 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. The curse of what? The curse of Genesis 12, 3. Listen to what Adam Clark wrote about these two verses in Galatians. Adam Clark lived 1760 to 1832. All that seek salvation by the performance of the works of the law are under the curse because it is impossible for them to come up to spiritual meaning and intent of the law. And the law pronounces them cursed that continue not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. Hence, quoting, hence, Every Jew is necessarily under the curse of God's broken law. And every sinner is under the same curse, though he be not a Jew who does not take refuge in the salvation provided for him by the gospel. Close quote. Every Jew is under the curse. Every unbeliever Gentile, Jew, notwithstanding, is under the curse. Since 1948, the majority of the American church has taught that we are to be a blessing to this Zionist state of Israel created. By doing so, we are blessing a cursed system. The Jews rejected their Savior, crucified their Savior, persecuted the early church, and God judged them for their wickedness and their sin in AD 70 with total annihilation and destruction. Now, a, rein, a, a reinstated Israel has been created in, in, the, in the 20th century, a system that still rejects Jesus Christ, a system that honors and worships the law of the Talmud, which is as antichrist as it can possibly be. The Quran has nothing on the Jewish Talmud. And we, 
as a church have wanted to be a blessing. We wanted to be a part of a cursed system that has rejected their Messiah and our Savior and still today is living in deliberate, willful rejection of their Messiah and our Savior and is a works-dominated system which very plainly, Paul says in Galatians, is under the curse of the law. So has America been blessed or cursed since 1948 and the way that we as a nation have, quote, blessed Israel? Go back to 1948 and previous and compare to what's happened in America since 1948 and tell me what has it done for us? Have we been blessed or have we been cursed? Look at our family life. Look at our political life. Look at our social life. Look at our entertainment. Look at Hollywood. Look at the entertainment industry. Look at our economic system. Look at our political system. Look at our church life. What's happened to us since 1948? Has it been a blessing or has it been a curse? I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that all of this stuff that we've heard from churches about blessing Israel so God can bless us, what we should have been talking about is blessing Jesus so God can bless us. And by blessing this apostate, Judaistic system of the Zionists in Israel, we've actually become part of the curse that God gave to Abram in Genesis chapter 12. In my column a couple weeks ago, Dates That Destroyed America, and you can go read it and you can come to your own conclusions and add your own dates or whatever. Six of the dates were before 1948. And 15 of the dates were after 1948 and much more frequent. I know that's not a popular position. And I will hear, <laughs> I will hear from people this week. But what if it's true? What if it's true? What if we have made ourselves part of the curse instead of the blessing? And if God would destroy Israel in judgment, don't you think for a minute that God would spare the United States if judgment were needed. Instead of the blessing of heaven, the churches of America have maybe unwittingly, I'm sure, because I was taught it myself for many, many years and believed it myself for many, many years and taught it myself for many, many years. So unwittingly, perhaps, made our nation part of the curse of the law. Sobering thought, isn't it? What should we do? In conclusion, let me give you five things. To all of you, 
Number one, recognize that the most important reason for going to any church is the message preached by the pastor. Nothing is as important as that. How many gymnasiums they have and how many recreation centers they have and how much playground equipment they have and how many kids programs they have doesn't compare to the message that is preached from the pulpit of that church. That's the most important reason to go to any church. You know why most people go to church today? This is what all the George Bonner research says. The number one reason why people go to church is to be with friends. Number one reason. Goes back to the social aspect of church. Social club. That's not the reason to go. The message the message is what counts. Secondly, do everything you can personally to encourage your pastor to preach the truth, to not tickle the ears of the congregation, and to stand with him when he's under attack. Because if he does preach the truth, he will be under attack. If you want him to keep preaching the truth, you better let him know it. Because I promise you, everybody else is letting him know their position. Stand beside him. Help him. Encourage him. Let him know you're going to be with him. Even if your best friend walks out the back door, you're going to stay with the message of truth. Let him know that. Number three, when you find a faithful truth-telling man of God, support him in his work with your prayers, your faithful attendance, and your financial giving. The work will not go forward without the prayers of the people, the attendance of the people, and the financial giving of the people. You can... Say all you want in flowery, pious terms. The bottom line is, if God's people do not support the message with their attendance, their prayers, and their giving, that message will dry up on the vine in that place. Number four, take the biblical principles that are taught to heart. Learn them, apply them. Be teachable. Be willing to unlearn things that you may have learned incorrectly. Have a heart that is open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. When the principles are taught, you study them and you apply them and you let God use them in your heart individually. It's not just one person standing up preaching a message as true as the message might be, if the people do not take it to heart, if it does not change their lives and become a part of them and their, and their work for the Lord and their discipleship for the Lord, then what good does the church do us anyway? Is it really about potluck suppers and lunches? Is it really about playgrounds and gymnasium? Is it really about socializing with our friends? Is not church supposed to be a place where a man of God preaches the word of God, gives people the truth of God, and the people of God hear and absorb the truth that is given, and it changes them, and it makes us the body of Christ and the army of Christ and the family of Christ that God wants us to be. And then lastly, recognize that God's blessing or judgment on a nation or community is mostly God's blessing or judgment 
on his pastors and people. I hear all these hyperboles about all the problems and most of the solutions go back to politics in people's minds. Electing this person, electing that person, passing this legislation, not passing this, it, it's as if in the minds of most Christians the answers to our country's ills are politics. Really? God's blessing or judgment on a nation is mostly God's blessing or judgment on his pastors and people. The condition of America today is not because of our politicians, that's just a symptom. The problem is the pastors in the pulpits and the people in the pews. If we don't get back to that awareness, and if we don't start refocusing our attention, Understanding that the solution to our problems primarily doesn't lie in the White House, it lies in the church house. And if we don't get back to that understanding, we're going to be electing people and not electing people, and we're going to be involved in this political cause and that political cause and the country is going to continue to go down the spiral to destruction because the politicians can't save us but the pastors and churches can and God is going to bless or judge a nation primarily because of the pastors and the Christians in the pews. So the bottom line no matter who wins any election you and I still have a job to do. Go ahead. Let's stand for prayer.